Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about international trade disputes, particularly between governments or trade blocs, how these disputes are resolved and their implications for businesses. The second in a series of shorter sessions, the Institute of Export and International Trade is running about trading in uncertain times. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for the next half an hour or so. Next slide, please. We're going to begin today's webinar with a poll to understand a little bit more about you, our audience. So if I launch this poll now, as you can see, we are asking you about your level of confidence regarding doing international trade in the current post-Brexit post landscape. The options range from very confident to not at all confident, and there's a not sure option too. This is a poll with clear and continued relevance to today's topic, so your answering it is very much appreciated. While you are doing so, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, uh, particularly towards the end of the webinar, though please bear in mind we have received a lot already in advance, so we'll not be able to get to all of your queries. If you feel that your question has not been answered, please do review our technical helpline or training and consultancy offerings, which we will be talking about later on in the webinar. Just a quick tip on questions. If your questions are easy for me to understand, I am more likely to ask them. So please do try to keep them concise and clear. Secondly, you will receive access to today's slide pack and recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to the presentation itself. But I'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer that poll and I will close it now. So I'm going to share the results. So always interesting to see what you say to this question. 57% uh, of you are quite confident, 19% very confident. So a very confident audience on the line today. Great, great to see. Uh, just under a quarter of you are not very confident. None of you are not at all confident, which is great to see, and P percent not sure. So thank you, everyone, for answering that poll. Uh, and if we move on to the next slide now. So thank you, everyone, for answering. As you can see on the next slide, on this slide, it is my delight to be joined by Paul Woodward, a trade and customs consultant with the Institute. And we'll, we'll be joined later on by Ray Bergen for the Q&A. Uh, Ray is a customs and trade specialist at the Institute. Now, Paul, that was a really interesting response to that poll from our audience as ever. Before we go into the, into the presentation though, we know post-Brexit rules have been introduced for exports to the EU already and are coming in for imports from the continent in the new year. Is there any likelihood of these rules as they stand changing in the coming months and years and what could cause this? Thank you, Will, and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session. I suppose, um, yeah, things are changing as they do through different period times. We've had the border operating model. It's now in its fourth revision. I think it would be amiss of us to say there won't be further changes to come. Also in relation to easements being um, revoked or maybe extended even further. The element here is to be really key on um, your products, your services being updated with the the relevant changes which are coming in which could affect you um, and, and you as a trader as a business and also being aware of the integrated trade tariff being aware of things like the MFN rate your third country duty rate aside from potential preferential rate you could get in the current guise with the free trade agreement that is currently in place I think it's really important as well Will just to mention that we do have our 2022 series of lunchtime learnings taking place um, towards the end of January and any topics which come up for changes for traders that need to be aware these will be on this series that will be running all throughout 2022. Thanks Paul and um, indeed you can see all of our webinars on export.org or UK for such webinars we actually had a question in from Madeline about the GVMS process um, unfortunately, we won't touch on that today, Madeline, because we're covering that in another webinar tomorrow, uh, which is taking place, I believe, just after lunchtime. And Paul, again, will be our speaker there. So do look on the website for more information about uh, those webinars. Um, but 
a lot to get through today. So on the next slide, to say a little bit more about the series and this new suite of support, uh, over to you, Paul. Oh, thank you, Will. Yes, and welcome everyone yet again. So yeah, again, obviously we are we are living in uncertain times, very choppy waters within um, the regulatory landscape at the moment. And with this, the IOE and IT have put together enhanced, enhanced support for members and clients, um, which is there where we're, we're, we're manning up with real-time export and import planning support to offer you in regard to this new suite that we're offering and the challenges that business could face. This comes into the light of real-time news alerts. You're probably aware of um, the LinkedIn, um, the communication to members through emails, keeping you abreast of the latest discussions, changes and impacts that could come to the forefront. We have an enhanced telephone helpline um, for business members only, but again, you can contact us, get advice if something's concerning you. We've got a live web chat function, which has recently gone live, helping experts to answer your questions. And even if it's out of hours, you can leave a message with a consultant that will come back to you in our working hours. We've, we're developing a range of webinars. So this is a second one out of our out of our series of trading in uncertain times. We're developing and soon to be launching a brand new one day training course of key areas and functions that business should look at in these times and mechanisms and controls that you could be able to put in place to mitigate any issues which could occur. And we're looking and developing a brand new consultancy package coming to your business either remotely or face to face about managing trade change and risk and how best to manage that for your business. Move to the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to look, um, these are our key agenda points. Um, so we're going to look at what is a trade dispute. We're going to look at the WTO trade um, dispute mechanism. What's the process for Northern Ireland? Really hot on the agenda at the moment. What does it mean for the free trade agreement? What does it mean for the Northern Ireland protocol? We'll be looking at trade cooperation risks. So that free trade agreement we have in place with the EU and also understanding what those risks are that could come out of that. We're then gonna focus on some key considerations that we would like traders to think about and ways in which you can support your own business needs. And then we'll be opening up, as Will said already, to that Q&A session. So let's move on to the next slide. So what is uh, a trade dispute? I suppose that's the most pertinent question for today. Um, usually this is where companies, other parties such as countries, are increasingly seeing the opportunity to use dispute resolution mechanisms under international trade and investment agreements to enforce their rights and protect the interests of a country. Yeah, And this really is when a World Trade Organization member, government, believes another member is violating an agreement or a commitment. So we've seen this, we've seen disruption to the agri-food section along with lots of other sectors which have been um, seeing greater delays, more licensing, um, more costs being brought to the business. So this is where this dispute mechanism will lie. Um, and this country that could be in effect will use this multilateral system for settling these disputes instead of taking unilateral action. And these can take um, various forms. So trade disputes um, can include trade remedies brought in under um, national laws um, with an oversight via the World Trade Organization agreements and disputes can be done on an international body which would be the World Trade Organization and whether a country has breached its trade agreement obligations. It must be really clear to really understand that the bulk of the World Trade Organization dispute settlement cases have always and will continue to this day to involve um, challenges to a member government's use of trade remedy laws. I suppose a recent example of this would have been the World Trade Organization case where they challenge Australia's plain packaging law for tobacco products as inappropriate and interfering with intellectual property rights of foreign manufacturing companies. This was really defining whether Australia, in regulating to public health, they did so inconsistently against international obligations in regard to intellectual property. Um, so it's a really good example there just to be aware of some of the trade disputes that are in place. Um, 
and also free trade agreements. We have signed one between the EU. Um, these all include dispute mechanism processes as well. So if one party is unhappy with the other, they think they've breached it, then those dispute mechanisms are clearly detailed in that agreement. So first off, we're going to have a look at uh, another example here um, in regard to um, the, U the US and the EU aviation um, dispute. Um, this was really um, a set longest um, dispute in World Trade Organization history. Um, it resulted in 25% of US tariffs on a range of goods, including Scotch whiskey. Linen was also in there as well. And this really resulted, if we're specific about the, um, the Scotch whiskey industry, this resulted in 600 million pounds of losses. Um, just bring it in the next slide, sorry about this. Okay, so now we've got a timeline here for what happened. So believe it or not, it's actually started in 2004 when the US filed a case with the World Trade Organization against the EU, arguing that they were illegally subsidizing um, European large civil aircraft. So that was done by Airbus. I'm sure we've all heard of that. The EU then, as retaliation, um, complained against the US for its unlawful support of, of Boeing. So this is where it all kicked off in 2004, which um, was really pertinent. Following the WTO initial decisions, both the US um, and UK imposed punitive tariffs. So again, here we can see 2018 um, bodies finds the EU hadn't complied with the rules, also from a US perspective there as well. Um, then in March 2019, um, the body finds the US hadn't complied. So again, taking about a year's period here, the first filing by the US, that was verified by the WTO and then for um, US involvement as well against the EU. In 2019, um, October of that year, the WTO authorised the US to take countermeasures against European exports. So at that point, they started imposing 25% um, tariffs on a range of EU goods. Um, this wasn't just um, in regard to, um, to aircrafts as you'd think it would be. It went kind of across the board there. So um, this affected stuff like aircraft, nuts, tobacco, spirits, handbags, and even tractors. Um, and this really had the value with these tariffs of over 4 billion US dollars. There was 15% on aircraft, 25% on non-aircraft products. So this led to an extra $1.1 billion in duties being paid by EU importers. So we can really see that benefit and how it, how it impacted. Then obviously, October, a year later, the EU took similar countermeasures against um, the USA with tariffs as well. In November 2020, the US, not ready to reach a negotiated settlement, so guess what? The EU imposed more tariffs on them. So again, kind of a tit-for-tat operation here. Um, then December 2020, um, the US changed the reference period for calculation of sanctions, increasing the range um, of goods subject to tariffs within their, within their tariff schedule. And then finally, in June 2021, the UK and the EU reached separate deals. So why was this the case? Well, we'd left the EU. Um, the UK in its own right could um, agree dispensation and a process with the US government, which saw the release of tariffs from a UK perspective to the US and also um, in regard to our products like Scotch whiskey. Um, and this was all imposed um, in this dispute for over five years. But, you know, it should be noted that should either country, um, country support for these um, businesses um, cross the red line, then, and it means that they're not playing fairly, it's not a level playing field, then they do have the ability to reactivate tariffs that are being suspended. So it's really important just so it's not a done saga in that respect. Another example we have is in 2018, the US imposed levies of over 25% and 10% on steel and aluminium from 
the EU nations, leading to retaliatory measures from the EU. And actually, we were still part of the EU as well then, so that included the United Kingdom. The US and the EU reached a deal this year to suspend these tariffs, but this does not include the UK. We are now not part of the EU. So the UK has launched a consultation of its own measures on tariffs, which were upheld in May 2021. Um, as we can see here, there is a report in the Financial Times, which was done the 1st of December this year, um, and that the US will maintain these tariffs, but will put pressure on UK over the Northern Ireland Protocol. So again, you can see the impact of a trade dispute putting weight in other areas of concern for the UK government. And today, um, the Trade Secretary, um, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, uh, is meeting the US counterpart, Catherine Tay, um, with these tariffs being a key talking point. So again, EU released, but obviously not the UK because we're not part of the EU. Now these discussions are starting to happen again. So what about the Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, um, it was created, as we know, to avoid a hard border in the island of Ireland and to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And when we look at this Article 16 elements, this really allows either party, so the EU or the UK, to implement safeguard measures if there's a couple of things which might happen. So if there's a serious economic or environmental difficulties, diversion of trade. And do remember, the EU briefly invoked this for the supply of COVID vaccines not that long ago. You know, think it, um, bearing in mind that they were looking at that supply with Northern Ireland being part of the UK, we were rolling out our vaccine programme. So they briefly invoked this in regard to that supply. So it's really um, important to be aware of that it isn't the first time that Article 16 has been in the press. Previously, it was by um, the EU. The UK, as we know, has threatened to trigger it currently during the negotiations over future rules of the protocol. This really particularly centres around medicine, agri-food trade, which have been greatly affected, and the role of the European Court of Justice in its implementation. We must be very clear here, though, that um, the EU, again, has is putting in place retaliatory measures if the UK does trigger Article 16, and that's something we, um, that every business should be aware of and how that is going to affect our trade. Remember that withdrawing the trade year would also result in the UK going back to World Trade Organization terms, which we will be discussing later on in today's webinar. So what are the trade, so what are the risks that we would associate with um, trade cooperation agreement? Well, think about it, at the moment we have um, free tariffs if you satisfy under rules of origin. We don't have any quota levies. We can put as much or the EU can put as much as they like into either market. Means that preferential rules of origin would go. No, 0% if you qualify. This would be based on the most favoured nation tariff. Um, there would be additional regulatory controls which would be put in place. Any dispensations we've seen, especially in regard to product certification, marking, extra licensing, extra border controls could come into place. These are all negatives from a supply chain perspective and create extra hoops that a trader will have to jump through. There could be ban on certain goods that could definitely come into play. Um, and any special provisions could be removed, you know, that creates additional barriers to trade, which we spoke on on our first webinar last week. Um, and obviously it can make goods or services more expensive to be imported for customers. Again, losing business revenue. So what are WTO terms? Well, this is a way of describing uh, a trade relationship based on the World Trade Organization rules when there's no free trade agreement in place or if it's been revoked. Um, this still means that uh, the World Trade Organization will use a non-discrimination principle again. So again, this means that all imports would become under the most favored narrative. Um, most favoured nation tariff, um, third country duty rate, as you see it in the integrated tariff tool. Um, and these results, you know, could uh, create additional costs into the business. Um, and 
it could relate in trade blocks, uh, which do apply for other countries like Australia and China. So when we look at the Northern Ireland dis, um, Protocol Dispute Mechanism, um, we're looking at if Article 16 is being triggered, um, then a uh, dispute resolution process will start. It's often referred to as a way to simply cancel the protocol or at least get rid of bits that the, you know either country doesn't like. In reality, it's a lengthy consultation process and arbitration, yeah, um, and it can can go on for various times. In the first instance, if it was triggered, Article 16 will be called um, when it leads to serious economic, society or environmental issues or diversion of trade, which we are seeing at the moment. And this then would be triggered by one party or the other um, immediately putting that into place. That then would head into a consultation through the Joint Committee, which has been set up as part of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Then no measures, retaliatory measures, safeguarding measures can be put in place by either the EU or the UK for one month. So again, you have to trigger it, consultation to see if a remedy can be quickly be um, agreed. If no, then safeguard measures, retaliations can come in a month after that that's been acknowledged by, to both parties. Measures would then be adopted and rebalancing measures can be applied. So we saw with that, EU US example on aviation, you know, US put measures in place, then rebalancing measures, retaliatory measures were used by the EU, all those increasing customs duties. Then after three months, after the initial month, um, the safeguard measure um, will be reviewed after they've been implemented. From that, they will either be retained or there'll be a resolution in place. And then this is an ongoing consultation where every three months after the previous, the safeguard measures would be reviewed to see if there is a, um, a point where obviously both parties now agree and they can be removed through um, positive dialogue. So we've looked at Northern Ireland protocol mechanism. Now we're gonna mention obviously what the dispute settlement process is um, with the World Trade, World Trade Organization. So it all starts off with the Trade Cooperation Agreement. That's a free trade agreement we have in place between the UK and the EU. Um, and this can be initiated. This means it could be completely revoked or there could just be parts of the, um, the free trade agreement which one part is unhappy with. So it doesn't have to be the rev revocation of the whole agreement. And that's a really important um, comment to make. Then we kick off with once both parties have been aware there is a consultation and mediation with the World Trade Organization, which lasts for 60 days, so that's two months there. After that, the World Trade Organization with other WTO member countries will set up a panel and they will be appointed 45 days after that initial two month period. The panel then will report back to both parties within six months time in regard to their outcomes from, from that review and from the dispute that's been raised. Um, and then the final report to the World Trade Organization members will be then drafted and concluded within three weeks. As you saw in um, the EU-US dispute, um, the panel came back and that's when the World Trade Organization say, yes, um, EU have infringed, you can put up um, tariffs, do some retaliatory measures there. And then after that, um, a dispute body adopts a report which has taken place 60 days after that. And then these can be accepted um, from, the, from the dispute body report or either party can then um, appeal the report 60 to 90 days after it's been adopted. And this again, then you can see it's not the end of the process. Yeah, This can go on like we've seen, the longest dispute, the aviation, 17 years. 10 years with the China-US dispute as well. Um, and then you can adopt um, that appeal within 30 days, days of the appeal report. And this is an ever, ever ending circle. And as we see here with a timeline, we're looking at 60 days initially, then we're looking nine to 12 months, 15 to 16 months to get to the end of the appeal process. But this can be an ever going circle like we've mentioned already. 
So how do we prepare for the worst? Um, well, um, business should be aware of really the impact of trade measures. Is there new non-tariff barriers such as extra licensing, extra controls, extra inspections that needs to be done at the border? Be prepared if anything's enforced that the other country will retaliate. So being aware of what controls and elements are going to be implemented, which could affect your product and your supply chain. Ensure that your monitoring tools are um, effective so you can be a proactive response. So a good way of this is to look at the trade tariff tool. Understand potentially I'm paying this duty rate now. If we went to WTO terms, what would be my tariff exposure there? What would be the extra debt I need to pay? And then after that, looking at things like special procedures, which can help a business in regard to mitigating um, those duty threats and also look at licensing controls, what we do now, what we might need to do in the future, just seeing if your products are affected. So great, so that's come to the end of the slide deck um, for this. So I would like to hand over now to Will for the questions and answer session. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting presentation. I think those timelines in particular are really useful to see, just to, to show everyone that if something major does happen, like Article 16 being triggered or yeah. the parts of a trade deal are kind of uh, revoked or uh, suspended in, in retaliation, that these, these things don't happen instantly. There's, there's a, uh, a process in place, at least provided the UK acts within kind of multilateral um, precedents and, and, uh, and law. But um, as noted, we'll head into the questions now. We're delighted as well to be joined by Raymond Bergen for this part of the webinar. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Uh, so, Paul, to begin, you mentioned yeah. Article 16. It's been in the media a lot. Sure. Just how likely is it that Article 16 is actually going to be triggered, though? Well, I suppose there's, there's greater fears now which are being um, understood that the UK will trigger this um, and probably potentially due to the rhetoric. You know, we've had neg negative communications, a bit more positive in recent months. Um, but it really bains on how strained those relationships with the EU will get. Yeah. What's the likelihood? If talks with the EU do collapse, um, then it's really going to be dependent on if any middle ground could not be found and what the dialogue between both parties is. I suppose if we look at Article 16, it is a clause in the Northern Ireland Protocol, one of the key elements of that withdrawal agreement. Um, it allows either side really to take steps, safeguards, um, and if it leads to serious economical trade dispute, we can see this with the agri-foods at the moment, along with other sectors, um, disparity. Um, and in that case, then we'll be talking about Annex 7 of that agreement, um, which outlines how Article 16 will operate. Um, neither party really wants to implement safeguard measures. Yeah, it's it's not proactive for either either customs union and I mentioned customs unions the EU and Great Britain stroke the UK um, the UK government is maintaining its stance with that but it also must be noted that the EU is already drafting potential retaliatory measures to put the UK off triggering this clause so both parties aren't going to want it it's dependent on how the communications and the middle ground can be found um, they are up and down at the moment. But again, we do have that leeway of time before anything can be implemented, which is always really important to, to be aware of, Will. It's, it's also the, the potential for the US view on Article 16 being invoked as well, uh, you know, their influence, and obviously the UK government potentially quantifying what the negative effects of any US involvement could have you know, on our trade as well. Yeah, no, it's a very good point, Ray. I mean, we've 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 looked at that today with in the examples for aluminium, haven't we? We've got obviously um, foreign trade secretary going over to speak to the counterpart in the US. They're using the NI protocol as a as a key discussion point, along with trying to both parties come to an agreement over. Um, steel and aluminium as well. So it, it is relevant and you can get outside influences um, which can bear put extra pressure to have a resolution in place. But I suppose it, it depends on the um, EU and the UK stance there and how 
productive these talks can be and that if a middle ground can actually be found. It's important is that the world is very much watching what's going on with these, these talks. Yeah, yeah, most definitely it can also influence other free trade agreements that we're looking at. We've got the Trans-Pacific at the moment, which, um, you know, would open up um, Asia Pacific um, to ourselves. We've been recommended by Japan and Australia there, but it can also, you know, um, bear fruit in regard to those disco um, ascension processes which are taking place at the moment. I mean, if the EU were to withdraw the trade deal as a retaliatory measure, um, obviously tariffs become a significant uh, possibility and that could be a real, yeah. have a real impact on businesses. I mean, Sarah's uh, raised in the comments, uh, how is it fair in this day and age that a country can implement purely punitive tariffs for a political stance? And I mean, ultimately, it's, it's not in anyone's best interest for these things to happen. It's certainly not in businesses' interests. Yeah, how sure. can businesses identify the, the tariffs that could come into play? and, and what can they do to mitigate the possibility of this happening? I suppose if the yeah, you're right. Where if the EU is there to withdraw, I think we we've got to really bear in mind that these are protective measures. We've seen in the US with the Trump administration, and also in the Biden administration, not going for free trade agreements, taking a protectionism approach. Um, just be aware, if there's no trade deal, then preferential duty rates go out the window. Yeah, you can't get zero percent there will be a duty which will be required. And that could be more than what we're looking at at the moment. Remember that, yes, we've got the same tariff numbering structure as the EU currently. Um, that could change with HS 2022, which I know we're doing a webinar on soon. But it's really a key element is to remember that um, no agreement is legally binding um, to target tariff reduction. Um, individual WTO members have listed their commitments. And this comes through the Uruguay, the Uruguay Round Agreements, which were put in place in 1997. Mitigation would really come under looking at your current tariff rates and what you're paying under the free trade agreement. Then with the integrated tariff, looking at what the new tariff rate would be. If we went to WTO terms, what we would, what that bill would be what would be that extra duty exposure. And then really to calculate this based on volume of imports that you are doing to understand what that extra exposure could be. And really investigate um, custom special procedures. It's another form of a duty mitigation process, but the first thing is always gonna be evaluation. Evaluate, I'm paying this now, what could I pay in a worst case scenario? And then looking at elements, controls, mechanisms, which then can reduce that for you. Yeah, just just to add to that, Paul. I mean, the larger companies that are already uh, receiving their monthly MSS reports could use that as a as a financial mechanism to sort of calculate what the potential risk could be and, and put that into their business continuity plans at least to uh, have some advance notice of what that that cost could be. Yeah, it's very true, Ray, and it's a good point to make these management support service reports by HMRC. Not all businesses use them. It does give you, you know, what you're paying from a monthly perspective from a tax and from a, a duty perspective uh, and being able to look at that with your volumes, understand what your current spend is and then what your potential future spend could be allows you then to make that part of the the continuity plan which you've mentioned so it's a very good point indeed. I was going to pick up on the MSS uh, as something just so if, if one of you could uh, speak a bit more about it but also the integrated tariff so I mean Paul can you say a little bit more about what that is and then how traders can can find it online? Um, the integrated tariff well yeah that um, you just put the integrated UK tariff tool in any Google search you'll bring it up and this predominantly allows you to classify your goods. Um, it has a, had a great revamp recently in regard to country of origin rules, um, obviously how you can attest um, to what licenses you would be needed, what government bodies you may need to speak to. And it will also bring in there from, um, it'll have a third country duty rate, which is your MFN rate, um, which is what we'll pay if we don't have a free trade agreement or you don't qualify under rules of origin. And then a preferential duty rate as well, if you do qualify. And these are really useful tools there to understand what products you are moving in international trade, 
what the duty and the licensing requirements are. There could be a, con uh, a consensus there that actually, if we you know, revoke the trade cooperation agreement, we now could have licensing needed if we're going to export or import goods, which predominantly wouldn't have been there before. You may have an element of blocks, so certain materials will be banned from being able to be brought into the UK from the EU as well. So they're key elements to be aware of. I don't know if Ray would like to speak a bit more on the MSS reports at all. Yeah, the MSS report, if you uh, just type into sort of Google search or sub browser search management support system customs, um, that, that will give you the UK government web link where you can actually find more details and actually apply for it. It's, uh, it's an annual subscription of around 260 to 280 pounds a year and uh, HMRC will provide you Excel spreadsheets every month to support your uh, inbound and your outbound uh, customs transactions. Uh, it's a great report and it can be used as a business management and finance uh, system. Yeah, I suppose another thing really to mention on Ray, uh, if you go to that, that link there, they also have sample reports on the HMRC website. So you can actually see which each port, what data sets it includes and how that could be beneficial for your business. There are four types of reports you can get. Each one costs £240 a year. So it's not £240 for all four reports. They are individual, but you will get those on a monthly basis. They'll be based on your URI number and your import and export activity based on what reports you go to look for. But they, there is samples there. Please look at the data sets. They are really beneficial. And, you know, different reports have a lot more data and some are just an overview. So just make sure you're picking the right ones for the business there, I would imagine. Thanks, guys. I've put links to both the Integrated Tariff Tool and the MSS um, guidance from HMRC in the chat. So if you want any more information about either of those, please do have a look at those links. I hope that's useful. That's um, great. Thanks, Will. Question in from uh, Lucinda, who's asked, what other uh, impacts would withdrawing the deal have for businesses apart from the tariffs? And we've also had a question in from Harminder, who's asked, yeah, sure. how else could the EU retaliate if it doesn't go as far as withdrawing the trade deal? Uh, Ray, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, it, it could be a, a, a number of things. I mean, certainly, uh, as Paul pointed out, it could be uh, you require more permits, more licenses, more other supporting documentation. Um, potentially certificates of conformity or certificate of origin, um, more than just the, the normal declaration on a, a commercial invoice. Um, what I would suggest is to also look at your contractual T's and C's as, as well, and just identify that or get yourself comfortable that there's nothing there that is amiss. Um, and also look at the, the force majeure clause because there might be certain activities that, that the respective governments do that you could actually look to force majeure because these things are out of your control um, and, and look at uh, look at those elements of your of your contract as well. Yeah, in terms of other potential impacts for other potential ways the EU could retaliate apart from withdrawing a trade deal. Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose I'll take that one to give her a little break there. So you've got your non-tariff trade barriers. So this is these are actually more restrictive than the actual tariff barriers themselves um, because they can reduce trade through two channels. Um, they can increase the cost of doing business, so raise the cost of doing business quite specific with permits, licensing, restrictions, bans on certain types of products. Um, and they sometimes can reduce full access to the market. So your products could be not be allowed to be supplied or be imported. And also quotas can be raised as well, like we have with Chinese steel entering the UK at the market. Um, we can put limits, quotas on the, the amount of those types of goods which could be imported. So there is a range of hosts um, of controls that we would be looking at, which could come into play. The, the most serious, I think, is the non-tariff barriers. Um, duties always are very important from a business cash flow perspective. Um, you've got other elements like we could put in contingent trade protective measures. So this could be policies that protect the economy, 
from the impact of certain imports, so anti-dumping measures, safeguards for agriculture. Other elements could be financial measures, so it could be policies that regulate access to foreign exchange for imports, for example, by requiring deposits to be paid in advance, and that customs duties must be paid ahead of the time. And could have the final one probably there, another one would be measuring um, affecting competition. So for example, compulsory requirements to use national services or use of a single state owned importer for some goods. We saw that with the support for Airbus and Boeing between the EU and the US as well. So subsidies can come into place to support domestic producers against importing from other countries. So there's a, a raft range of non-tariff barriers, Will, that could actually be enforced. So quite a range also, of, sorry, right. You've got the um, emissions controls, you know, the global footprint um, targets, you know, they could actually tighten those up and make it more difficult to move plastics around, you know, again, those additional tighter controls. Yeah, sure. I fully agree with that, Will. So there's a range of really quite specific things that you could do if if it gets to this. So it's, I mean, I guess a lesson for traders is to always just keep an eye on the details. It's, it's it can be a range of things which could affect you, but it's the details which could also really impact your business. Um, yeah, I think Will, just before we move on, if that's okay, always do be aware of this extra support that we are giving to traders as well through the new um, trading in certain times portal. The support if traders you know, are unsure, then the membership gives them that ability then to speak to consultants so they can mitigate um, any of the challenges they may face in the future. So it is worth re-emphasizing that point. Perfect. Thanks, Will. That's, a, that's an important point. Um, sure. Just before, me and we're starting one a little bit thin on time, so I'll do um, one more poll on the next slide. Okay. Um, and I'll ask one more question during that poll. All right, let's get you to this. There we go. Asking, has your business taken on any additional training to adjust to new post-Brexit trade rules and processes? And it's a simple yes or no option there. And just while people are answering that uh, poll, we'll do one last question. Uh, this is coming from Ross, who's asked, can the UK be impacted by trade disputes not involving the UK, for example, the US-China dispute? Uh, Paul, do you understand that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, we've we've looked at a few today. The Australian packaging they infringed IP rights. Um, we've 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 talked about the US China, which does have you know impacts for ourselves. Um, again, you've seen obviously the aluminium, the steel um, we've mentioned today, with obviously the the foreign minister over there discussing that but again on the table is a northern ireland protocol so again there's lots there for you know for example trump administration refused to allow new appointments onto any wto bodies you know that they can influence these decisions safeguarding measures we still have those in place for aluminium and steel when we were part of the eu but the EU have settled that dispute, the UK haven't. So again, still an impact there, which we should be aware of. Um, definite protectionism measures, which are out there at place by countries now, trying to safeguard their own industries, um, definitely. We've also got um, some concerns as well in regard to maybe infringements, which may be put in place. Um, so looking at energy transition um, from a global footprint perspective. Ray's already mentioned the emissions. Um, the US um, and China, they are looking at renewable sector and they can put extra controls and restrictions onto the UK. Remember, we don't have free trade agreements with the US or China currently. So again, this is coming under the WTO membership and what controls and enforcements are put into place there. You know, just expanding on that protectionism you were talking about, Paul, that, that could sort of lead into percentage content, uh, with, you know, based on the rules of origin, whereby certain yep. countries could be looking to have, um, you know, more percentage content before you can actually declare your goods as a particular origin. Yeah, I mean, do just be aware there are, there are generic and country rules of origin. 
the free trade agreement itself puts those non-originating material percentages in there um, and they can be greatly changed if there is no free trade agreement in place you know these can have knock-on effects to business which then makes it harder to kind of attribute to um, preferential origin as well so it is very important really interesting answer very broad answer as well so there's a few different fi elements of uh trade disputes which could impact for uk businesses there's obviously those sure. involving the uk itself so whether that's formerly as part of the eu or whether the uk now and it's the aluminium being an example of both um yeah, sure. disputes um there's also the ones in terms of the multilateral agreements so things around environments um kind yep. of post cop 26 stuff anything involving wta but there's also the us things which aren't necessarily directly involving the UK, but potentially have supply chain knock-on effects like the US-China uh, yep. dispute. Most and definitely. There's well. plenty, plenty more out there, of course. But guys, I think we, we have run out of time. So on the last slide, um, I was going to say thank you again to Ray and Paul for the presentation and for the answers. Some really interesting stuff. It's a huge topic and we've only scratched the surface really in this uh, shorter format, but we hope you have found that useful. Um, but before we go, just a reminder that today's webinar comes shortly after the launch of our new Trading in Uncertain Times suite of enhanced support, helping traders to continue trading despite Brexit uncertainties, global supply chain issues and ongoing geopolitical tensions. As Paul mentioned earlier, this suite includes real-time news and enhanced telephone helpline for our business members, a new live ch web chat function, a new online training course and consultancy, and more webinars just like this one, including the one on HS 2022, the new set of commodity codes which are coming in um, next year, that webinars on Wednesday next week. For more information, please do visit export.org.uk forward slash trading uh, in uncertain times with the underscores in between the words, the URLs there, and of course, we'll be showing the slides and a recording of this after. So. We'll, we'll send you all the information that hopefully you need. But for now, everyone, thank you for tuning in. We hope you found that useful and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.